like I usually do, I went out first thing and I made a pot of hot tea. Kind of cut way back on drinking coffee. It was bothering my stomach. I think I'm getting old, but that's all right. Amen? And then where's Chuck? God bless senior moments. Amen? Because that opened the door for your brother to help you out. God provided. Amen. So, but I kind of quit drinking coffee so much. So I get up and make a, a pot of hot tea that I drink with honey in the mornings. And for Christmas this year, Dory bought me a, a little mug that has a kind of a rubbery lid that goes on it so I won't spill, I guess. It's, a, it's my sippy cup, okay? And, uh, but it's this brown mug and it says, I love my wife. Uh, that's just really, yeah, thank you. Uh, that's just, that, and, and so after she bought it, I use that cup every morning. And this morning I got up and I made my pot of tea and I went about some other business. And then when the tea was ready, I couldn't find that cup. And I mean, it, it's just weird. I am so used to drinking out of that cup every morning now that I didn't know what I was going to do. I mean, seriously, the tea just wouldn't taste the same out of just a regular coffee cup anymore. And so I spent a whole bunch of time looking for it. I had this real bad habit also of I'll, be, I'll carry that cup around and I'll set it down and go do something else and can't remember where. So it was in the garage. I have no idea what it was doing there, but I finally found it. You know, we are kind of creatures of habit, aren't we? Yes. Amen. Yes. Yeah, there we go. I thought so. Seeing that song up there, there was one verse that said, uh, I love to tell the story because it's done so much for me, or something like that. And you know, that is one of the reasons that, that I went into ministry, is because of what Jesus Christ has done for me, and the change that He's made in my life. The problem is that I, like so many of us, fall back into old habits and habitual things. We make these habits more than we make them real heartfelt stuff sometimes. I think that's what Jesus is dealing with here in Matthew chapter chapter 12. If you want to go ahead and open your books or your Bibles, we're going to finish Matthew chapter 12. Jesus is dealing with these religious people the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, by the way, if you're using the Pew Bibles, it's on page 690, I'm sorry, but uh, Jesus is dealing with these religious people, very ultra-religious people. The people, uh, and, and sometimes religious people are the most difficult people or, or they have the hardest time seeing the truth. These religious people that Jesus is dealing with here seem to be finding every excuse not to accept what's really true, not to make any changes in their life. They want to keep doing things the way they've always done things because after all, that's their, you know, it's like me and my coffee mug. you got to have that mug. Well, they had their religious way of doing things and, and they didn't want anything changed. And Jesus comes on the scene promoting change from their religious world and they, they just didn't like it. So what we see in the beginning of chapter 12, we saw that uh, Jesus challenges the Pharisees' observance of the Sabbath. He was going around doing stuff and they were asking, what are you doing? You know, you're, you and your disciples, your disciples are picking heads of grain and they're eating them on the Sabbath. You can't do that. You can't heal people on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to do good on the Sabbath. And Jesus points out their misunderstanding and their misapplication of the Sabbath law. It really upsets them. And then we saw that Jesus is doing miracles and He's casting out demons and the Pharisees accused Jesus of driving out demons by the power of Beelzebub. How did you do that? You don't have the power or the authority to do that. And Jesus again reveals the error of their argument. He warns them that this is the power of the Spirit of God and you better be careful what you say about the Spirit of God and its power in this world. 
And so now we come into chapter 12 where they want a sign. Now he's already done miraculous signs and they credited that to Beelzebub, but, but they are so set in their way, so stubborn and resistant to any change, they just keep coming up with one excuse after another. We'll do this. We'll do this. Well, you can't do that. And so follow with me. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. And then some Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. And he answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now one greater than Jonah is here. And the queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now one greater than Solomon is here. When an evil spirit comes out of a man and goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it, then it says, I will return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and it takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. See, the Pharisees want their son. They want Jesus to prove what he's saying about who he is and what they are called to do. And so Jesus reveals that they will have a sign, but it's not going to be right now, and it's going to be the sign of Jonah. Three days in the earth. And Jesus also reveals their faith because they won't listen. He says, you know, in Jonah's time, Jonah was called by God, and Jonah was, was seriously just an awesome preacher. He walked through the entire city of Nineveh, and his message was basically 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. That's all he said. And yet the whole town repented. They knew that this guy meant business. That what he said must be a message from God and therefore if God is speaking to us, we better make some changes. He's a great prophet. Solomon had this great wisdom. And in fact, it was so well known that he spoke a wisdom given to him by God that the queen of Sheba, the queen of the south, traveled great distances to hear this wisdom came from God. And these Pharisees, on the day of judgment, Jesus says, those pagans, the pagans from Nineveh, the pagan queen, are going to rise up and they're going to condemn you because one even greater than Jonah is here, one even greater than King Solomon is here, and you guys won't listen. You won't make any changes in who you are. The religion of the Pharisees was really like an empty house. You see, they had everything so structured. They knew their, they knew their pattern of doing things, their way of doing things, and that's all they did. They just kind of went by. We did this, 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 and therefore we're good. But inside they were empty. The house looked good on the outside, but inside there was nothing in it. It was, it was perfect. It was swept clean that day. I want you to understand this. How many of you like it when your house is neat and in order? How many of you like that? And swept clean? How many of you like that? And empty? How many of you like it when your house is empty? Yeah, you're not quite sure on that. You know, you talk about when the kids are gone? <laughs> and so we read this, we think, well, it'd be great to have our house nice and tidy and swept and, and cleaned and everything. We all like that. But Jesus says that's not the way a house is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be empty. It's supposed to be filled with something. Jesus 
probably is referring here to the, the Babylonian exile when the people came out. I'm not 100% sure what he's talking about, about this generation at one time having the evil cast out of it. But, it, but he's referring to the fact that at one time, something within this generation had it made them clean again, but rather than filling the house with the presence of God, it just made sure that everything stayed perfectly in order. Made sure that this was in its place and that was in its place, and that's all they did. They were empty. They had nothing but their religious facade that was going on. I want you to flip over a couple pages with me to Matthew chapter 15. Because Jesus speaks more harshly to these guys a little later on. We'll see it when we get there, but I wanted to point it out to you this morning. Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 7, he says, You hypocrites. Now what's a hypocrite? Someone who acts one way but really is another. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. It was all just external. There was no heart in their faith. No heart in their religion. Look over in Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, it says, beginning in verse 1, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to His disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. And so you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and they put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels of their prayer shawls long. They love the place of honor and banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi. It's all for show. Drop down into verse 13. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those who let those enter who are trying to. <coughs> Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Now notice what he's saying about these people. They're converting people, but they're making them worse than to begin with. Because they bring them in, they tell them that we've cast out the evil that was within you, but they don't fill them with anything. Look, look down in verse 25. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will be clean also. See, these Pharisees, for all of their religious practices, were filled with evil, unclean spirits. They were worse off than they were before. Church, I want to suggest to you that we must become, be very, very careful that we do not become merely religious. Now that term religious a lot of times really means that you do the same thing repeatedly. I use that coffee cup that Dory got me religiously. I take my pills religiously. I work out religiously. Now that's not true of me, but some people would say that. But what that means is they do the same thing repeatedly. 
And it just becomes a habit. It becomes part of what they are. And, and these Pharisees, they were trying to force Jesus to fit into their religion. They had everything set up, the patterns that they went through, the way they did everything, and they wanted to make sure that Jesus just fit into that. And church, I want, to, I want us to think about make sure that we don't make Jesus just fit into our religion. We have our patterns and our habits, the way we do things. And I was thinking about this this week. You know, one of the things that we do as a determinant of how religious we are is we attend Wednesday night Bible classes. And I was thinking, I wonder if Jesus was here walking among us, if he would come to our Wednesday night Bible study. You ever thought of that? First of all, would Jesus need a Bible study? I mean, he could be the teacher. But think about that class. If Jesus was our Bible school, was our Bible study teacher, I wonder if he would ever hear the thing that you know I hear every now and then. I've been a member of the Church of Christ all my life, and I have never heard anything like that. As if what we have always heard and what we have always understood and what we consider our religion must be right. Therefore, anything that comes and stalks on that, we definitely don't want. Are any of you with me? Can I get an amen? That was a very weak amen. Am I stomping on toes here today? Amen. Amen. Sometimes our practices can lead us away from where we really ought to be. Uh, a woman named Betty Sanders was the executive vice president for Nordstrom's back in the 80s. Uh, is there Nordstrom's around here? Does any of you know what Nordstrom's is? Okay, it's, a, it's like, like JCPenney because actually they're part of the story. Well, she told this story. She was the executive vice president. She told this story at a seminar. And it was recorded by this guy whose book I'm reading, so I'm telling it kind of secondhand, so don't, if, if I don't get every detail just right, please forgive me. But she said that back in the 80s, uh, Nordstrom's was just really doing well. I mean, their business model was uh, the one everybody looked at. In fact, one time, at one time, the, some executives from Nordstrom's invited some top executives from J.C. Penney's to a luncheon. Now, of course, they're competitors, right? J.C. Penney's and Nordstrom's. And, but they invited these executives from Penney's to a luncheon. And during the luncheon, one of the executives from Penney's says, what is it that you do that's made you such a success? Because every company out there now is studying your business model. What do you guys do? And one of the executives from Nordstrom's stood up and walked into the next room and he came back with a great big book, a big old book, and he set it down on the table and he said, we do everything that's in that book. The executive from J.C. Penney's spun it around and looked at it. It was written over a hundred years ago. It was the original book on administrative process for J.C. Penney's. You see, J.C. Penney's had gotten away from the reality of what they were supposed to be about because they were trying to create themselves rather than focusing on what was already right in front of them. We need to make sure that we don't get so caught up with trying to be something else that we miss what's right in front of us. These religious leaders were so focused on appearing right and appearing religious and appearing to have everything in order that they missed the, the real truth of Jesus. And that is that you're to be His family. He doesn't want you to pretend to be religious. He wants you in a relationship with him. And in fact, that's, that's what this next little story is about. Back in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 46, 
While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. And someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. And he replied, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now I want us to understand, Jesus is not talking here, uh, he's not rejecting his family. That's not the purpose of, of the story here. The story is really about who is a child of God with him. Who is it that can actually call God Father? And it's those who do the will of the Father. It's not the religious people who question Jesus and deny Jesus and try to fit Jesus into their religious mold. It is those who accept Jesus, who learn from Him, who sit with Him and walk with Him despite what everybody else around them is doing. It's those who not only speak of doing the will of the Father, but those who actually do the will of the Father. And Jesus says, these are my brothers and my sisters. These are people who are members of the family of God. And so the question that we should ask ourselves today is, Am I religious or am I a disciple? Because there's a big difference in those two. Do, do I live my life in the presence of Jesus doing the will of the Father? Or do I live my life the way I want to live it and then I go through some empty habitual motions that make everyone see my religion? I was at a wedding reception the other night and I heard a, a story from the brother of the groom. He got up to make his speech and his toast and, and as brothers do, he had to tell something about his older brother. And, and he said there was one year that his brother played baseball. And throughout the entire summer, for every single game, he never swung at one pitch all season long. And he said everybody was encouraging him, telling him, you know, why don't you try swinging at one? You know, even if you strike, that's okay. Why don't you just try swinging at one? And he'd always say, okay, I will. But he never did. The entire season never swung at one pitch. And as they were telling, and he was telling this story, I was thinking, you know, he, he's in his uniform, he's got his bat, he's got all of his equipment, he's been to all the practices all along, and it's that time now for him to be in the game and even though he looks like he ought to be in the game, he's dressed right, he's got all the right equipment, and he's there, he's never in the game. No matter what pitch comes his way, he never swings. And I wonder, church, if that's not a great description of us. We're in uniform. We're at the practices. But here's the pitch. You see, this is our objective. To go out into the world and make disciples. Or as we're going out into the world, to make disciples. Teaching people about Jesus. Living with Jesus so intimately that Jesus and our relationship with Him becomes known as we live out that life in the world around us. Here's our pitch. The question is, do we swing? Or do we just keep dressing up and showing up for practices. And so today, I think, church, it's important that we decide that we're going to be disciples. I don't care how long you've been religious. It's time for us to become disciples. People who walk daily with Jesus Christ, who sit at His feet, who listen to Him teaching. We need to fill our house with the presence of God and the relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you're here this morning because it's the religious thing to do, I want to encourage you today 
to step up and become a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you need to do that, we invite you to please come forward while we stand and sing this song.